And welcome back to the regular council meeting for the Township Whitewater Region on Wednesday, April 3rd. And we recessed just before, um, as we started at 11 a.m. With, uh, with a closed meeting. Uh, so just to recap, the regular meeting opened at 11.08 a.m. after a short presentation. Uh, council moved into closed session immediately at 11.08. A break was called at 12.18. And, uh, and now we are reconvening at 1.02 p.m. And just to highlight, uh, the, only item, uh, the only item that was discussed and closed is the item that was listed on the agenda. No direction was provided. Good. So now we'll resume back to the agenda as presented. Um, the first item is our uh, national anthem. If I could get people to stand, please, and face the flag. And just before we jump into the land acknowledgement, I just wanted to let everybody know, including any of the watchers on our live channel, that I'm not wearing the chain of office today because I broke it. <laughs> and, uh, and our poor clerk has to figure out a way to fix the chain. So um, that is why I'm not wearing it. And in terms of quorum, we recognize that we have two members of council not present today. Uh, Councillor Bell has been unavailable all day, uh, and Councillor Olmstead was able to attend our first section, our first session, or first portion of the meeting from 11:08 until 12:18, I believe. So he was recognized, will be recognized in the minutes, but is unable to attend this afternoon. Good. Next is our land acknowledgement. As we gather, we'd like to acknowledge, on behalf of Council and our community, that we are meeting on the traditional territory of the Algonquin people. We would like to thank the Algonquin people and express our respect and support for their rich history, and we are extremely grateful for their many and continued displays of friendship. We also thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. The adoption of the agenda is the next recommendation that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve the April 3rd, 2024 agenda. A mover and a seconder, please. Deputy Mayor and Councillor Moore. Is there any uh, proposed amendments or changes that you'd like to make in the agenda? Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? And it's carried. Uh, next is some minutes. We have uh, March 20th, regular council minutes, regular council meeting minutes. The, the, the recommendations of the Council of Township Whitewater Region approve the March 20th, 2024 regular council minutes. Mover and a seconder. Councillor Tabert, Councillor Moore. Is there any errors or omissions that anyone on council saw in those minutes I'd like to raise? Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? And it's carried. Next is uh, committees and boards. And I'll note that we have one committee, uh, sorry, one um, board uh, set of minutes that are enclosed for your perusal. The Muskrat Watershed minutes from their February 15th meeting. And I recognize that uh, Councillor Tabert, <coughs> did you have anything to, to add as our appointee to that uh, set of minutes? Uh, nothing to add, Your Honor. We spoke, I spoke about this at the last meeting, only this is the final minute, so. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Excellent. 
Good. Next item, uh, disclosures of interest with respect to anything on the agenda today. Is there any disclosures from any member of council? Seeing none. Carry on to presentations. So at this point of the meeting, uh, for those people that are watching, we're going to pause the regular council meeting <coughs> and immediately move into a public meeting as required by the uh, uh, Planning Act for a zoning amendment. So I will call the public meeting to order at 1.07 p.m. The application for us before us is a zoning amendment D-14-197 for Greenwood Road. And I'll turn it over to the planner for some comments. Okay, thank you. So I'll start reading the uh, appeal statement. If any person or public body does not make an oral submission at the public meeting or make written submissions to the Township of Whitewater Region before the bylaw is passed, the person or public body is not entitled to appeal the decision of Council of the Township of Whitewater Region to the Ontario Land Tribunal. The person or public body may not be added as a party to the hearing of an appeal before the Tribunal unless, in the opinion of the Tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. Under Section 3411 of the Planning Act, if Council decides to refuse an application or refuses or neglects to make a decision on an application, within 120 days of the municipal clerk receiving the application, the applicant or the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing may appeal to the tribunal by filing an appeal with the clerk of the municipality. And section 3419 of the Planning Act states that not later than 20 days after giving notice of passing of the bylaw, the applicant, any person or public body who made an oral submission at the public meeting or made a written submission to council before the bylaw is passed, or the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing may appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal by filing an appeal with the clerk of the municipality. So with that, I will provide an overview of the application. It's a pretty straightforward one this afternoon. So it's been submitted by Keith and Sharon K Hakeoff for the property um, that our mayor described. Uh, the application is submitted as a condition of consent for application D10226, and this was conditionally approved by the Committee of Adjustment last July. Um, so what is happening here is the um, applicant is seeking an amendment to the bylaw to change the zoning of the severed lands in that application um, from rural with an exception, exception 68, to just regular rural. And right now, the zoning on the property is RU exception 68, which allows for a microbrewery as an additional permitted use on the property. So the purpose of this application and the condition of the consent is to make sure that the exception only stays with the retained lands and not the severed lands in the application. So just in terms of policy, which was reviewed um, in more detail during the consent application, the lands are designated rural in the official plan. Um, and uh, residential uses are permitted in the rural designation. There is also um, areas on the property that were identi identified as uh, may containing significant valley lands. So one of the conditions of the consent was that the applicant do an environmental impact study uh, that was done and um, it determined that there would be no impacts provided a few mitigation measures are in place and uh, making sure those are in place will be part of a development agreement which uh, the applicant will need to do um, separately as a condition of consent as well. So just to give a little bit more uh, detail on the zoning, so the, the existing property was zoned with the exception um, back in 2020 uh, to allow for a microbrewery. And we heard about the site plan for this microbrewery last year. Um, so this, the same property owner applied for a consent to sever a residential lot off the property. Um, so the purpose of this and the purpose of the consent was to create a residential lot. So if, we, if the, the property didn't get rezoned, then they would both be zoned for that exception. And when we reviewed the consent application, we were reviewing an application for a residential lot, um, not to have another neighboring brewery right beside um, the existing one. So that's really what, what this is about. Um, but both the severed and retained lands will comply with all of the other applicable provisions of the bylaw. So the only thing that is being um, considered here and recommended here is just to take the severed lot and put it back to a regular rural zone. 
Um, just lastly, we did receive one comment um, from a neighbor, and uh, that comment was circulated to council members. Um, and just to note that the um, neighbor did have some questions about what was happening, um, and just some overall questions about the zoning in and around the property, and staff explained that we're only right now considering the rezoning to rural. So I'll, I'll stop there and I'm um, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Planner Benzi. Excellent. So I understand that the applicant may be available virtually and I will offer the applicant the opportunity to speak on behalf of his application at this time. So Mr. Haycock, would you like to have a moment to speak? Oh, oh there we go. We've got you. The floor is yours. Okay. No comment at all. Uh, it's straightforward. I just want to start so that uh, the house can be built there. And that's it. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, next, I, I note that we do have a couple of members of the public present, so I will offer the opportunity. Is there any comments from anyone present here today? None. Seeing none. Good. And I'll just confirm, Clerk, did we receive any other comments in writing or? Any other means? Uh, just uh, like Planner Benzi said, we did receive one comment uh, by email and it was circulated to Council. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, at this point, uh, a final opportunity for members of Council to ask any questions to the Planner or to the uh, proponent on the proposed amendment. Okay. Seeing none, I can now adjourn the public meeting. And again, the public meeting is as per the Planning Act, an opportunity for the public to be able to speak up against or for this zoning amendment. So it is adjourned at 1.13 p.m. and we will resume our regular council meeting. Good, I'm getting nods all around the table. Excellent, the next item on our agenda is 6.2, the health unit uh, is going to present, do a presentation to council, and I believe we're going to be welcoming Mrs. Melissa Botts, who's doing the introduction, Sorry, and clerk. So welcome, uh, Melissa. Thank you for coming in. Melissa Botts is the coordinator of the Emergency Preparedness and Foundational Standards for the Renfrew County and District Health Unit. She's been with the organization for almost six years. During this time, she has supported emergency response for the Renfrew County and District Health Unit during the flooding, adverse air quality events, heat and cold events, opioid overdose events, and COVID-19. She supported the planning and the, sorry, she supported the planning of the community opioid overdose response plan and is working on an all hazard infectious disease plan. Prior to this, she worked as an infection prevention and control coordinator in a small urban hospital where she was supported by the Ebola, sorry, Ebola virus disease response planning, Middle Eastern uh, respiratory syndrome response planning and the flu pandemic planning. So uh, thank you, Melissa, if you just bear with me a second, I'll get your slide ready to go. Thank you everybody for having me. Uh, I'm happy to be here and share a little bit about the health unit and the emergency management program that we have there and how we can better work together because really that's the goal right if we're prepared maybe we won't have any emergencies here's hoping <laughs> um, next slide please so i just want to acknowledge the lands which we reside renfrew county and district health unit is located on the unceded territories of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. We honor the land and peoples of the Algonquin Anishinaabe whose ancestors have lived on this territory since the time immemorial, and whose culture and presence have nurtured and continue to nurture this land. We honor all First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples, their elders, their ancestors, and their valuable past and present contributions to this land. Next slide, please. So 
Obviously, we have a set of guidelines and standards that we must maintain. Under the Ontario Public Health Standards, we have a requirement for emergency management. I will say that this is under review. Uh, Post-COVID, there's been a lot of changes, so this may change slightly, but as of today, this is still current. The Board of Health shall effectively prepare for emergencies to ensure 24-7 timely, integrated, safe, and effective response to and recovery from emergencies with public health impacts in accordance with the Ministry's policy and guidelines. So we are responsible for enacting the Health Promotion and Protection Act. Uh, and I'm sure that you heard all about it during COVID-19 because they did Section 22s. That's why you had to stay put, essentially. <laughs> no movement, right? We had to wear the masks also from a Section 22. So that's part of that. But when you look at sort of more local lens, when you guys had flooding, we supported with water testing. And when you guys need some safety messaging, for example, the wildfires last year created quite a stir <laughs> with air quality, we provide you with safety messaging so that you can roll that out to your staff, your residents, make sure everybody's safe, the children, everyone under your, your guidance. Uh, we also have regulations under that act. As well, we have guidelines and then, of course, Ministry of Health often sends us extra little things, which also happened during the pandemic. And then we're responsible for ensuring that that's enacted through the areas that we reside over. Next slide, please. So, public health and emergency management, what is it? Does anybody recognize this picture? Do you know what it is? What is it? So it's not a tetanus, you're close. You got it when you were a child. Polio. Yes, polio. <laughs> so they've gotten a little bit better. They don't leave a mark anymore. <laughs> but these were sort of those first rounds. Apparently they were quite painful from what I understand. But starting in about 1910, we actually saw polio in, uh, in Ontario. The first case was in 1910 in Hamilton in Ontario. So then we started to see an uptick in these cases. And you get it essentially from eating fecal man matter. I know, a little bit gross, but really that's what happens. It's in the water, you put it in your mouth, oops, then you get sick. So in 1953, they had the highest case count, which was 9,000 cases. And shortly after that, thanks to some innovative work at the University of Toronto, they actually developed a vaccine. In 1955, they rolled out the vaccine campaign, which is where this comes from. <laughs> it's much better now, it doesn't leave Mark. <laughs> But it took until about 1970 before all those cases started to drop off. In 1994, we were declared a polio-free zone or we eradicated polio. Since 2004, we do get the odd imported case from people who are under vaccinated. But my point with this is that public health and emergency management have walked together for a very long time. Right? They had an emergency of polio, they had the iron lung, they had all these sick children, they had paralysis, they developed a vaccine and rolled out those mass immunization campaigns. Next slide, please. So, sorry, it, it looks better on a smaller screen. I apologize, it's not very legible. I do think you got them in your notes. But this is the emergency management cycle. Public health has a play in all of these areas. Sometimes it's hard to recognize those, particularly at that response, right? We're not going in to fight the fire, the firefighters are going in to fight the fire. So sometimes it's hard to see those nuances, but for example, in cases of the wildfires, we provide you with support of when to make recommendations to your residents, 
when to make recommendations to those workers who may be working outside. Uh, when you're looking at prevention, I mean, if you go to our website, we have lots of information there, right? There's immunization information, how to stay well, um, stop smoking, all of those things are there. So that's prevention, the mitigation or sort of your immunizations. We run uh, immunization under the Immunization Schools Pupil Act, we do immunizations for all school age children annually to make sure that they're up to date. One of those happens to be polio so that they don't get polio. For preparedness, and this is my shout out, don't forget about the health unit when you do your exercises. We like to, to come, it's a great time to meet everybody and learn what everybody can do. But we, we also run them at our health unit as well as 10 other municipalities. In the response, I mean, obviously, we just went through COVID-19. We know that we play a role in response in terms of case and contact management, um, rolling out orders, sometimes not everybody's biggest fan, but we're here to help protect you, right? And in recovery, it depends on the circumstance, but maybe during flooding, a school got affected. Well, we, we help you to or support you to determine is that safe? Do they have safe water? Is it safe shelter? Do they have safe food? Um, and we come around uh, pretty regularly doing inspections. I'm sure that you've seen other people from the health unit out in the community doing inspections for your small water drinking system. If you have an issue with your municipal water system, you call us, right? Because there may be a boil water advisory or a drinking water advisory. So that's sort of how that cycle plays into emergency management. Next slide, please. Uh, so potential implications. If you don't sort of work with us, well, food safety, you don't want to give everybody gastro. I'm sure of it. It would be terrible. Nobody would like you. <laughs> In terms of safe shelter, why do we talk about it? Well, if you declare an emergency and open up an evacuation center, we come in just to make sure food, water is safe, that you're meeting some of those regulations, right? We don't want people to come in with polio <laughs> and make everybody sick. So it's those kinds of things that we support you with. Um, and hazardous materials is a good one to rem as a reminder. Uh, we did have that crash in the Ottawa River last June with the armed forces, which was really unfortunate. Two people did lose their lives. But out of that, there was some implication that their, wa their water supply could have been contaminated. So we, we supported that to make sure that people still had safe drinking water. Obviously, outbreak of disease, we just went through COVID-19. I'm sure everybody understands that. Handling of deceased people, um, depending on the disease, you can still transmit it post-mortem. So we do make recommendations on certain diseases as well. Healthcare surge, as you know, it's easily done to go past what our healthcare system can actually handle. The capacity is not always great, so we need to make sure that we can support them in that. And infection control, so that's all that hand hygiene, masks, uh, you got recommendations through the whole, uh, the whole COVID of cleaning everything, make sure you're wiping things down, make sure it's the right strength, all of those things are things that we support you with. Uh, next slide, please, thank you. So, we give you guidance. We do lots of communications. Uh, we just did a media release for the solar eclipse, and we hope that you'll share. There's some social media posts as well, so we try to make sure that that health safety information gets out there, and we want to work with you to make sure that it's getting to your residents and into the hands of the people who actually need it. Um, we run mass immunization clinics, and Again, COVID-19, right? Those were huge clinics. I don't think there was any specifically here, but those clinics that were on the PEM ice were huge, right? We were doing 1,400 people in a day, and there was tons of volunteers. So the communities really came together to make those work. Case and contact management, 
Really an important tool. Uh, we're looking at measles right now. If you didn't know, because of the pandemic, uh, our younger populations became under immunized. So we're, we're pretty lucky here in Renfrew County. We were able to generally maintain those. You can see there's a little bit of a dip uh, during that 2020, 2021 years. But we've been doing a lot of work to catch up on those immunizations. But that's not the case worldwide necessarily or even right across Ontario. And because of the lower immunization rates, we're now seeing a resurgence of measles worldwide. There's outbreaks everywhere. So this is part of the ways that we work together, right? We get those messages out. Um, I'm going to flag identification of priority populations. I think that it's really important to notice this. We have all these subsets within all the regions that we live in. Well, we do a lot of work to break those things down. Who's underserviced? Who's in an older population? Who's in a lower income? Who has less access? And we spend a lot of time looking at those kinds of populations. So when you're in an emergency, we can actually work with you to look at the geography and look at who may be the most deprived within your regions and may need the most support. Next slide, and I, I did get the two minutes, so I will flag that we do have a website for emergency management that you can go to. It has lots of information available for you with safety information, uh, and that there's many other resources on our website. Next slide. <laughs> uh, we did recently roll out the respiratory illness uh, tool. And it's a good tool because it lets you know whether or not there is actual circulation of respiratory viruses, which is a big deal right now, right? Uh, we have hospitals who are still doing masking, long-term care facilities, retirement homes. You may even look at implementing it here if it got bad enough, right? So the, this is a useful tool. And for those priority populations who are high risk, they may want to look at this. Next slide, please. And you can skip this one because it's just additional information for it. Check out the website. All of those that information is there. Uh, so this is our contact information. And what I will say, is there any questions? I just wanted to make sure there was a minute or so left for questions. Thank you so much, Melissa. And the questions don't count towards your 10 minutes. Oh, okay. So you're fine. <laughs> Sometimes there can be long questions and comments from council, so we don't we, we, we don't count that towards your ten minutes. But thank you. Um, uh, with that, I'll open it up to the floor. Uh, is there any questions or comments from members of council? No, probably because it was a very detailed presentation. Now, I do have one uh, thing that I would share with you, because from an emergency management, uh, the and I heard it was mentioned in your introduction about the opioid crisis. Yes. Yes, and that is something under your portfolio? So I helped to develop our community overdose response plan. Um, we have seen a little bit of activity. Uh, I'm sure that you've heard that Pembroke ha is in heightened precautions. They're doing mm -hmm. some more monitoring surveillance. They do that in conjunction with us. So our EPI pretty much a couple times a week reviews that data. We get um, data from the coroner as well. We get some data from, it's called ACES, and what it is is it's a system that reviews all the medical records from the eMERGE department and it scans them and it lets us know what kind of visits they're seeing. So we monitor those two systems and those are our two main data sources as well as we have some anecdotal information that we take from the public and from our community partners. Now that's not necessarily included in the data we report, but it does give us some no notification, you know, if we're hearing from our partners and from our clients that something's going on, usually it's shown within the numbers as well. And it flags it for us to look. And it allows us to issue some of those alerts. I'm sure you've noticed some of those alerts go happen. Mm -hmm. Um, as well, the Algonquins of Pickwakanagan had declared an emergency back in December, and we do sit on their health coordination table to support resources and ideas. Currently, we're in the process of, not under my portfolio, <clears throat> 
but we're in the process of developing uh, a community drug strategy. Those initial meetings have happened, so I think there'll be more to come on that for sure. That's perfect. The comment that I'd share with you, and again, I, I acknowledge it may not be your portfolio, but just to share with you some of the feedback that we're hearing from the public is asking about training or information sessions on opioid, the use, how you might treat or how you might address someone that's, you know, having a, a either a drug problem or is needs immediate medical attention. So this is one of the things that communities are asking us more and more about. Um, but anyway, if you can, I, you that can definitely do some outreach to, to our, well, it's under the harm reduction portfolio. Um, you can definitely do some outreach. We do do community presentations. Um, we have worked with fire departments to do naloxone training. We have worked with different, you, I'm sure you're aware, but you're, you're required to have a policy on if you have an overdose and what to do with that. So we provide training for naloxone for, the, uh, for that as well. Um, so there are resources that you can reach out to. I know that we've done some community outreach with the grind and actually have done like presentations as well as with the Algonquins of Pick Rock and Gun. So if it's something that you're interested in, please do reach out to our harm reduction team. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and the only other thing I'll, I'd just like to acknowledge during flooding <coughs> situations, both uh, this term and, and the previous term, public health has been a great asset to the community. Um, and we really appreciate the efforts that you put forth to try to keep people safe. Uh, water testing is just one small example, but it's something that everybody who lives on a well appreciates significantly. So thank you so much for everything you do. Thank you for having me. Perfect, thanks. Excellent. Uh, next item on the agenda is the mayor's address. Uh, and I have some notes prepared. So uh, I hope that uh, everyone enjoyed their Easter long weekend and welcome to April with a snowstorm today. <laughs> so we kind of knew that was happening. Um, I attended only four meetings on behalf of council since our last council meeting. It's been a very uneventful two weeks. But I also attended Renfrew County and Health, a District Health Unit board meeting and a special meeting of the count, uh, County Health Committee and uh, County Council meeting. So busy on some other fronts, um, especially with the long weekends. On Monday, April 8th, there'll be a solar eclipse and that was mentioned by Melissa. So I stole some stuff from their website. A solar eclipse is when the moon moves between the sun and the earth. The sun's disk is partially or fully hidden from sight by the moon, resulting in momentary darkness. There'll be several communities in southern and eastern Ontario in the path of the totality, um, but Renfrew County and District is just north of this and will only experience a partial eclipse. So the solar eclipse is expected to start on Monday, April 8th at about 2 p.m. and last for about two and a half hours. It is always, like I feel like I'm talking to my kids when I say this, but it's always dangerous to look directly at the sun, especially so during an eclipse. Okay, so this can harm your eyes and even cause permanent damage and loss of sight. So there is lots of additional information on our RCDHU website, and I encourage you to check that out for some more details. Uh, it has also been a very dry spring so far. Uh, we continue to participate in our spring for Shet meetings uh, to monitor the level water levels in our rivers and our lakes, um, but they are low right now, so the threat of the flooding is low at this time. However, the dry weather has necessitated our fire chief placing a partial fire ban on. This ban prohibits open air special and agricultural burning. However, recreational burning campfires are still allowed. These fires must not be any larger than two by two feet and are to be monitored at all times. The weather conditions along with the fire weather index provided by the MNRF will be monitored and to help determine how long we'll keep the ban on and if it's necessary for us to implement a complete ban. Okay, so with the dry spring, there are some other problems. I also wanted to share some great news. Two of our youth here in Whitewater Region will be representing Ontario in the National Youth Bowl Canada National Championships in the first weekend of May. So congratulations and good luck to Ambrose Wadi and Carter Hamilton. And I believe we're 
providing some township and county paraphernalia for them to uh, demonstrate or show off when they're there. Tomorrow, April 4th, the County of Renfrew is hosting an affordable housing summit in Renfrew to explore utilizing municipal vacant land, innovating with existing properties and fostering partnerships, all to address affordable housing needs in the county. The Affordable Housing Summit is designed for developers, investors, real estate specialists, elected officials, municipal staff, anyone who is involved in housing development. So I will be attending along with some of our staff and I understand that it is sold out as of yesterday or the day before. So I'm excited to see what might come of this effort. Um, I think I speak on behalf of all of council that we would welcome any opportunity for a housing, affordable housing proposal here in Whitewater Region or in, fa in that matter anywhere else in the county where it could support our communities. Good, that ends my mayor's report for today. Thank you. Good, next item on our agenda is public comments and I understand we have some public comments today so I'm gonna hand it over to the clerk. Okay, so we have two people uh, in attendance. Terry Lynn, I'm sorry, I'm gonna probably mask your name, Chartrand, Chartrand, and Carrie Dunn. So Terry Lynn will go first. She is, uh, they both have comments regarding 9.5. So go ahead, jet green button on. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. My name is Terry Lynn Chartrand and I'm a resident of Hyla Road and Whitewater Region. I'm here to ask the council to consider leaving Hyla Road as is. I ask that we consider maintaining the status quo by continuing to patch the asphalt as needed. In future, and when funds can be secured, reassess the project and carry out the resurfacing of DST in the worst areas. I attended the council meeting on March 20th. After listening to council and staff comments, along with other information provided, I understand budget and funding are of prime concern for all. Given the information in regard to funding, it would appear that leaving Hyla Road as is would be the most cost-effective measure at this time. To tear it up and replace with gravel creates a large expense, and replacing the, service with the, the surface with DST at this time seems impossible. I realize listening to this, you may be thinking it's just a road. What is the big deal? Move on to another topic. Gravel roads are everywhere across Ontario, and why is this one so important? Well, it's important to our community. It's important to the residents and families who choose to buy and build homes on Hyla Road. For many, having a hard surface road was an important part of the decision to purchase. It is important to our taxpaying neighbours who wonder what is going on. Why are taxes going up and services being removed? or change to a lesser quality. Lastly, changing the road to gravel would be a step backward for our community's progress. In closing, the residents of Hyla Road have shared their concerns and perceptions with you, our council. We wish to leave Hyla Road as is until other options and funding become available. I do hope you consider the concerns of your constituents when making the decision. You are our representatives and our voice. We simply ask that you represent us and find a solution that will work for all. I thank you for your time. And then uh, Carrie, uh, Carrie Dunn, if you want to come up, thank you very much. Honorable members of council, I urge you to vote in favour of keeping Hyla Road a DST rather than converting it to gravel. This decision has significant implications for our community, affecting not only the convenience and safety of residents, but also the overall quality of our infrastructure. It is, evidence, it is evident that the recommendation to convert Hyla Road to gravel lacks thorough analysis and consideration. The Public Works Department's presentation appears to lack proper metrics or data to support the proposal adequ adequately. It's concerning that only one perspective had been presented at the time of the initial decision, overlooking critical factors that should be considered before such a significant decision is made. It's crucial to prioritize the long-term interests and safety of our residents over short-term cost-saving measures. Let's ensure that our infrastructure decisions align with the vision of a vibrant and thriving community for generations to come. 
Thank you for the time and attention to this matter. Thank you to both presenters. And I'll just ask the clerk, is there any other public comments that were received in writing or orally? Uh, received no, no other. Good. And I just have to acknowledge, uh, I did receive an email from Mrs. Chartrand. Is that correct? So I, we all did? OK. So uh, I just want to acknowledge that as one received in writing. It reflected pretty much her presentation. But I wanted to make sure that we publicly acknowledge yes. that. OK. It's good. Everybody has received that? Perfect. Okay, good. So those are our three public comments um, that will be included tonight. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks, Melissa. We are not offended you leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. So that leads us on to the, and sorry, I will just say uh, the reason for the public comments. Wh why do we insert public comments as an agenda item? It's an opportunity for anybody that's monitoring the agenda, has an opportunity to provide input to council as we make these decisions. So it is, an, it is a, a, just another opportunity for the public to engage directly with council in the decision making process. Excellent. Um, the next item on the agenda, item, or, item nine, are reports. We have a number of reports. First one is 9.1. So this is where we revisit the zoning bylaw amendment that we had our public meeting about earlier where we received, we formally received any public input. This is the, um, this is the amendment coming to council for decision. The recommendation is that the Council of the Township of Whitewater Region approve an amendment to zoning category of the property described as part lots 27, Westmeath concession to WML N, West Muskrat Lake North. Yeah, I'm looking at the clerk or the planner getting the thumbs up. Greenwood Road from rural exception 68 to rural. A mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Trim, seconded by Councillor Tabert. And I will turn it back over to the planner if she has any additional comments. Thank you, Mayor Nicholson. So no, and given that there were no other new comments or concerns raised, I'll just reiterate that staff are in support of this application as it was one of our recommendations um, and a condition of the consent application. So thank you. Thank you, Planner. And I'll go to my mover, Councillor Trim. Any comments or questions? Good. And the seconder, Councillor Tabert? None. Any other questions from members of Council? Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favour? And it's carried. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is 9.2, the Rural Economic Development Grant, Community Marketing Project Update. So the recommendation is that the Council of Township Whitewater Region receive this report as an update on the Red Community Marketing Project, receive the Marketing Implementation Plan, and direct staff to proceed to Phase 2 of the project. A mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Trim, Councillor Moore. And first off to Planner Benzi. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Mayor, again. So I'll just start with a little bit of background and refresher as we last came to council with an update on this back um, in early November of last year. So this project was kicked off back in late 2022, early 2023. It's another partnership with the Township of Greater Madawaska. Um, and at the time, we had decided to apply for the 2023 intake of the Rural Economic Development Program, the RED grant program, which is offered by OMAFRA. Um, and so we applied for the grant in 2023, and the grant um, was approved uh, in June of that year. And the main thing we wanted to do with this grant opportunity was implement some of the key actions that were bo in both the township's growth readiness plan, as well as the business retention and expansion plan. And it's really to enhance our community marketing and promotion efforts. Uh, so after we received uh, the successful grant application, our first step was to work with, uh, with Greater Madawaska on issuing an RFP um, to get support with folks who are marketing experts. Um, so we had issued the RFP, and the, um, after the review of the responses, we found that Cinnamon Toast, who is here excitingly today, um, their submission uh, checked off the most boxes and um, had the highest result. 
So since that time, we've done quite a little bit of work, and I'll just also reiterate um, that with the project, with um, ourselves and Greta Mad and um, Cinnamon Toast, we had the following um, short-term and long-term objectives. We want to make sure this project um, supports and enhances what we're already doing in terms of promotion and communication efforts. And then from a longer-term perspective, um, we're looking at ways to increase investment into property and local businesses here, attract tourists and new business, and boost community pride. And uh, community marketing has been shown as an effective way to do that. So the first phase of the project was community engagement and the pre preparation of a marketing plan. Um, and each municipality got to do this uh, on their own with the support of, of Cinnamon Toast. And following this, the second um, phase is to implement a campaign or collateral based on the recommendations of that plan. So really, the purpose of doing the plan in the first place is to be strategic with their marketing efforts, uh, to develop key messages and target audiences and make sure that the messages are um, speaking to those audiences, as well as identifying channels and tools to reach the audiences and get our message across effectively, as well as to establish uh, reporting metrics so that we can track and evaluate our impacts and results. And this is something we're thinking about integrating into our, our quarterly reports as well. And again, this is really done to make sure that um, our efforts are strategic, effective, and measurable, and to enable us to course correct if we're not seeing the impacts that we're hoping for. So the second phase of the project will implement the material and one or two of the recommendations from the marketing plan. Um, and in future years, after this particular RED project uh, is wrapped up, we can still continue to use the plan to guide our ongoing marketing campaigns and other promotional efforts. So we're happy to announce that we've essentially completed the first phase, the plan and engagement, and the Cinnamon Toast team, three of them, are actually here with us today to um, present the work that they've done thus far, as well as their recommendations for phase two. Um, and after today, provided we have the council support to proceed to phase two, um, staff are going to um, kind of huddle and, and talk about which one of the recommendations we're going to proceed with um, for the rest of the grant. So I'm going to stop there um, and introduce the Cinnamon Toast team. We have, I believe, uh, Tara, Tara uh, Moira, and Bronwyn. And I understand Bronwyn's going to be kicking us off. So um, Cinnamon Toast, over to you. And, and thank you so much for being here today. Mr. Mayor and members of council, we're really excited to be here. We've been working really hard and doing all sorts of good stuff on the back end. Um, in terms of screen sharing, am I okay to do that? Yeah, I can, I can see myself twice in that meeting. That's cool. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask the question, just making sure that everybody can see my slide. That will clear we okay. Yes, we, we do see your slide. Okay, okay, awesome. Thank you so much. All right, so um, I'm not going to go through the entirety of the plan because that's quite a meaty document and I know that was attached in the agenda. So hoping that you guys have had an opportunity to review, but what I'd like to do today is just go quickly through the process that we took and some of the key findings. And then of course, um, knowing that the next step is the actual implementation of some of the, the recommendations that we've made. So. In terms of our approach, our first item was to get to know you guys. So in order to do that, we did a digital survey, two focus groups, and some one-on-one -on -one interviews. Um, the consultation included a diverse range of perspectives and included residents, municipal staff, and businesses. And the digital survey had 174 response, and we had two focus groups with 11 participants and seven participants for the one-on-one -on -one interviews. Um, this was all conducted by Pauline, our stakeholder engagement uh, specialist, and then she did a report of findings. Within that report of findings, we laid out all of the themes that we found utilizing thematic analysis. And really the nice thing was that we saw a lot of the same themes using this kind of decoding method. So we were able to see that there was a profound connection to the region's natural beauty, which was of course no surprise, a passion for outdoor recreation and a shared sense of community emerged as our dominant themes. So we did this in order to better understand um, your target audience and your residents and your visitors and those that might choose to come in the future and then your investors. And then of course we looked at all of the other previous data that was provided by our wonderful team so that we could make well-informed choices um, as we move forward with next steps. In terms of the plan vision and objectives, 
Um, I think really what we wanted to do, and we've already kind of gone through this, but just enhancing visitor engagement and exploration, improving awareness opportunities for outdoor activities in all seasons. This is important. And I think you guys are really unique as you do offer an all season package, um, diverse, diversifying promotion township wide to expand exploration. So using all of the communities and forging local partnerships to business growth. And these were these key objectives that we outlined um, essentially to promote tourism and attract investment in um, local businesses and properties. Then what we did is we built on target audiences and personas really. And we identified these six personas, um, these nature enthusiasts, adventure seekers, and these are kind of the same, but we kind of outline nature enthusiasts as more as those kind of relaxed outdoorsy people versus adventure seekers being more recreational sports. Um, business investors, of course, cottage lifestyle enthusiasts, love those, um, community ambassadors, and then history buffs. So when we were making our decisions around implementation and next steps and guiding kind of the philosophy and principles to move forward within the tourism, we really thought about these core people as our primary audiences, knowing that nature enthusiasts enthusiasts and adventure seekers were really high up on the list and making sure that we really thought about them um, because that's what you guys offer. So our plan recommendations, what we always do is kind of think about our core recommendations. And then within those recommendations, we laid out a whole bunch of opportunities and implementation ideas, some of which your team is already moving forward with, and then some of them just support greater growth and continuation of what has already been in process. So of course, our recommendation is to strengthen tourism strategies. And this includes, in this case, outdoor activity guides, itineraries, digital campaigns, which are seasonal influencers and user generated content. And then within our report, we outlined more details on that in terms of how you might do this, steps in which you might take to do it, and then of course, some kind of tips and tricks along the way. The second recommendation was amplifying storytelling efforts to unify communities, include stakeholder engagement activities, community spotlights. So this was just really kind of thinking about how to bring all of the communities together and cross promote so that it wasn't decided kind of into bite sized chunks. We wanted to create something that was a little bit more all encompassing and more of an umbrella brand, if you will. Recommendation uh, three was elevating marketing collateral. So we talk a lot about what we might do here. We created samples, some hashtags, some messaging ideas, um, and included paid and earned media, social media toolkit, content bank as some ideas of things to move forward with. Um, I will speak a little bit in terms of if you have any questions around what those implementation pieces were, but they are outlined in terms of why, the why and how and all that good stuff. Recommendation is to coordinate, coordinate community initiatives. This was a big one in terms of kind of how to make sure that all of the messaging and ideas were shared. So how do we have joint committees or a community development plan or a marketing toolkit that all um, communities follow or some sort of community bulletin so that everybody kind of is in the same um, or same wavelength and has the same kind of events or they don't overlap or they create larger events or, or plans. Oh, and then here we have note community calendar is underwear, which is great. And that was my very fast version of a very meaty document of all the goodies um, that we've been working on. And then in terms of next steps, um, we're looking for approval to move forward with some of the implementation action items. Um, and then of course, leaving this strategy in place for your lovely team to continue to implement. So that completes my presentation. So over to you, all of you in terms of questions um, or next steps. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, and I want to say your name, Bronlin. Bron, sorry, can you say your name again for me? Yeah, Bronwyn. Bron, Bronwyn. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. And I apologize for butchering that. I'll turn it over to Council. Uh, first, our mover is Council Trim. You've got the floor first. Any questions or comments? Uh, no, just fine. Good. And Councillor Moore, seconder. Just curious of how we proceed because uh, we aren't the only municipality involved in this. So, will um, whatever proceeds forward will be for both, or will each one be separate? Now, does that going to go to our <laughs> cinnamon toaster? Does that go to the planner? Uh, I can take that one. Um, okay. So, um, the the strategies themselves and the actions they're all done individually. Um, the grant was done with, with both municipalities and we did take some advantages of um, developing like a common framework. So the strategy and the plans are kind of similar in terms of the, the, the templates, but all of the material and the content is all unique 
to each township because we know that we are, are a little bit different than, than Greater Madawaska. So the, the recommendations are tailored to us, so we're going to be implementing our own. And so at this point, really, the two townships are kind of doing their own um, actions based on their own tailored recommendations. Okay, thank you. You answered my question. Perfect. Anything else for members of council? Good. Seeing none, I'll throw one at you. And I know that you highlighted on the very last slide, the very last thing is our tourist, like our large community not-for-profit tourist events. Um, and I'll highlight it again. Uh, the Beechburg Fair, the Cobden Fair, the... Um, Tour to Whitewater, and the fourth one is our fall Taste of the Valley. Between these four events run by not-for-profits, we have about 25,000 people attend them. Um, how, how do you see that, uh, trying to take advantage of that opportunity, or including that opportunity in, in your proposal? Good question. I think that really means the marketing collateral and the paid media side of pieces. I think part of the biggest piece is making sure that that's, that's a huge amount of people to bring to your community and how do you leverage that and how do you grow that and how do you build more events and our like-minded events or add partners or create influencers that want to come and then take photos and draw larger attention. So I think one of the biggest pieces is that social media strategy and that paid media and that advertising. So lending itself to kind of developing an overarching plan so that when you do advertise it, you're advertising um, at the same time, you're not, um, I guess, in competition with other, each other, and you have a, a solid plan to make sure that those are events are even more broadly attended. Um, so I think that's a big piece of the marketing collateral and the messaging piece that we outlined in the uh, strategy. The, the, the planner is giving me a thumbs up. It's good. Uh, Good, and the other question I just had with respect to funding, I acknowledge that the grant funding is not all inclusive and we won't be able to, to necessarily fund the whole implementation. Uh, the planner had mentioned just in her, in her introduction that there would be one or two items specifically selected. Can we just go back to the slide that you're going to select from? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have a number of items that we're kind of debating on, I think, um, with the project team. So let me pull that up. Um, so, so as it stands, um, and let's see if you can be specified and the itineraries are kind of um, in discussion, as well as the content thing. Perfect. No, and I understand. Uh, uh, I just wanted to kind of draw back to that master list that you're going to be getting into, into, into more discussions about. Does that trigger any other questions from Council? Yeah, Councillor Trim. Not a question. I just, I, I know uh, that you didn't mean to um, uh, forget about some of the other events uh, that happen in our community. Uh, you mentioned the four largest ones, but there are other smaller ones that are important to the community too. And, uh, and for the first time, we're going to have this fiber fair uh, in, um, in Beechburg. And uh, also there's the um, Canada Day events that happen in, in Westmeath and Forester's Falls. And so those are, uh, and there are others too, uh, that we, we, we need to promote um, because we do get an awful lot of um, uh, visitors uh, from outside our community that come to these events. And um, uh, I, I know that when you were mentioned, you mentioned that 
the four biggest ones, but there are others too that we need to be mindful of and uh, not let slip under the radar when we're, when we're promoting. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Absolutely, uh, I should have articulated that. Yes, there are Borka, there's all sorts of other events, but yes, those were just the top four largest. I guess is a better way to say it. Good. The last comment I'll, I'll provide is that I did notice in the detailed report, it does talk about the use of short-term rentals. And I know the issue is still with council as to how we might approach that. And that is going to be coming at a subsequent council meeting. So I would just ask staff that we wait until it's clear in terms of the council direction with respect to short-term rentals before we proceed with anything in terms of a marketing strategy that might refer to that. Good. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. Um, just a, a comment. Uh, moving forward, I, I noticed in the report there was quite a bit of information about um, trying to bring community together, um, bringing all communities together. We've been trying to do that for a very long time here. And I was just wondering if part of your recommendation, you might be able to, to take a look at that and see if there is some way, something that we're missing that we're not not uh, catching into, you know what I mean? Like if we could just find some way of, of, uh, of. Absolutely, and I'm really, I mean, not that this makes anyone feel better, but this is, we need to get to work with our communities and we have a little bit of a challenge um, in the sense that you have volunteers in each of those communities and kind of get them to coordinate or not overlap or see who that we needed in, in all of those different regions. Is, is, is a challenge. So absolutely, we can certainly make use of that. And I think that's why things like content bank or things that are accessible by all groups so that the marketing efforts are more consolidated, I think that's one of the biggest challenges that we see in terms of just communication in terms of how we do something, giving them the assets so that they can feel more comfortable and confident. This is how actually we use for this broader piece. Or this is to the other gentlemen's, uh, how do we Thank you very much. Anything else from Council? Good. We'll call for a vote. All those in favor? And it's carried. Thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate you coming in virtually. Thank you for the opportunity. Have a good one. Thanks. Good. Next item on the agenda, 9.3. Uh, the tender for the Beechburg Water Treatment Plant renewal. The recommendation that Council Township Whitewater Region approve the award of tender 2024-08 Beechburg Water Treatment Plant renewal to Harrington Mechanical Limited in the amount of 1595596.80, inclusive of non-refundable HST. A mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Moore, seconded by Councillor Trim. They're playing tag. So Superintendent Nicholson's gonna to speak to this one. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so some background on uh, this project. So the township was successful in receiving a Canada Infrastructure Program ICIP Green Stream Funding Intake 2 grant. And we received uh, 1.5, 1,512,499, 000 dollars in funding. Sorry, for a total project value of just over $2 million. Um, so, uh, the, uh, back in January, our first uh, construction tender for the Beechburg Water Treatment Plant Renewal Project was released um, on January 25th and it closed on February 26th. Um, the uh, tender received four bid submissions uh, that ranged from uh, just a little over $2 million um, to $3 million uh, for each of the, uh, the submissions that we received. Uh, at that point, uh, EVB, which is the, the town's 
uh, the township's um, consultant for this project. They recommended that the township reject all of the bids on the grounds that the project uh, would come in over of the approved budget by $446,000 and change. Um, and they uh, recommended that we retender with a revised scope uh, that included uh, removing uh, a pr some provisional items, uh, reparging of clear wall number one. Uh, it in, uh, also re uh, recommended removing uh, a drilled well that and all the associated works with that. Um, and it also did actually in, in, uh, recommend incorporating the supply of a new generator um, that was within within the scope of uh, of the contractor um, for the for a, a retendered process. So uh, on March 12th, uh, a second tender uh, 2024-08 was released, uh, and three bids were um, uh, were received, uh, with the lowest bid coming in from Harrington Mechanical Limited in the amount of one million five hundred sixty-eight thousand dollars. So. Um, uh, Basically, uh, the current cost of the project so far, uh, there we have some engineering fees in the amount of three hundred forty-nine thousand um, dollars, and the with this most recent tender results, uh, as well as um, some other minor costs, um, uh, the subtotal and non-refundable GST total pros, price comes in at one million nine hundred fifty-six thousand one hundred forty-eight and seventy-six cents which comes in approximately $106,000 uh, below the approved budget. So um, as we mentioned, staff are recommending that the project be awarded to Harrington. Um, additionally, we're also recommending that the remaining funds, approximately 5%, that $106,000, uh, be allocated to um, a contingency allowance. While 5% is a rather small contingency allowance, um, staff will uh, endeavor to uh, be very um, <laughs> determined with uh, with that remaining funds and if anything goes if there's uh, any I thought that this any additional work would go over and above that we would ret return back to council for approval if required so that's and that's basically it sorry Yes, manager public works. Yes, I guys want to add, um, so the project is a large project that will um, rehab the, uh, the Beechburg water plant. Um, one of the other reasons, um, um, I can say, um, with a project of this size, there is potentially have a, a, a boil of water. For example, one, one in case when we change the actual transfer switch and, and the, the generator, it, it may cause a um, loss of, of supply. In that case, it, it will trigger a uh, uh, boil water advisory. Um, we will work with the the uh, um, with the firm that will, will be doing the work, um, and well in advance that we'll we'll, we'll we'll notify the public um, by our um, uh, social media, and then also um, um, hand deliver uh, uh, door knockers to each resident. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Did you guys have any questions? Yes, yeah, so we'll throw questions. So the mover was Councillor Moore. Any questions? I do. Um, I would just like to say that um, I'm glad we revisited it and uh, put the tender back out because there, there was significant savings. Um, and anything that wasn't touched, then obviously the engineers don't feel that they're necessary at this time. So I was quite happy with the outcome. And I do have one question um, because the boil water advisory come up. Um, during construction phase, um, will there be um, a lack of water in that system, or will be we be okay for watering gardens, etc., and perhaps the odd fire? Yeah, I can see that. The, the, the only time that I see that the staffers see that there'd be a, sh that a boil of water um, would be if if, if, if if there's lots of, of supply. Um, additional to the, like what I said before with the um, with the uh, lack of uh, um, electrical to, to the to the plant to to, to create water, um, it, uh, uh, one other item would be if we have if we have to do work in the uh, in in the clear water, which is the holding tank for for the actual um, uh, processed water, um, and that may 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 trigger a a uh, boil water advisory. 
Thank you. Perfect. And Councillor Trim, the seconder. Yes. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Clerk McGonigal, uh, could you remind me, please, the, the amount of money in reserve that that we would use to cover the difference between the actual cost and the the grant amount? Thank you. Sure. So in 2023 uh, budget, um, we received or was pledged to have 1.513 uh, million dollars from ICIP. Uh, Infrastructure Canada, uh, and then our rates were through the rates we put in $550,000 into reserves for this project to bring the total of the uh, 2. Uh, 2.063 million. Perfect. Thank you, Treasurer. Any other questions from members of Council? Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, just one comment removing uh, the new drilled well, we took that out of the is is that any risk at all because if i can recall there was a time there was a issue with the water table is there any concern that without this drilled well that that could happen moving forward and what was the reasoning for removing the drilled well if we never needed it yeah so the the reason for um so the fact that there's there's two sources of water currently out there, there's the drilled well and the dug well. Um, both wells essentially draw on the same aquifer. Um, so uh, if one's if we had an issue where there was ever one to be dry, which there isn't expected to be, they both would be. Nonetheless, um, we have two wells and one is in, is, redun is redundant. So um, they don't actually both run at the same time. We don't draw on them at the same time. Um, essentially one's there in case something happens to the other one. Um, so what the understanding that we've received is that while um, a drilled well is generally more a more preferred uh, um, uh, system to rely on. Uh, the existing dug well is still sufficient for our needs. It does have a slightly, a very slightly smaller um, capacity under the ECA. So uh, the new drilled well would very, 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 a new drill will, will very minimally change um, our the, the capacity. It wouldn't essentially um, uh, increase it. What what was essentially I think we were trying to do um, with the replacement of the well on with um, if we could fit it in the budget, it would be it, it's, it would be a great bonus. But it's not necessarily that would be something that's absolutely required today. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't have enough. Sort of ex, um, additional funds to be able to do that. So, um, and the, the the new well itself was not actually part of the original f scope of funding. So by taking this out, we're not, um, uh, we're still meeting the, the requirements of the ICIP funding. So it was, it was if we could hope we can do it, it's great, but, um, unfor but unfortunately it wasn't. Yeah. Any other questions? I'll just note, and correct me if I'm wrong, but 1994 was when the initial capital investment went into that water system? Um, so the plant's originally from, I believe it's 1955, but it was last upgraded in 1994 yeah. when they put in um, the, the most recent package plant and, uh, and expanded the, uh, the facility. So this $2 million investment is required after 30 years of service? And we're being subsidized between the federal and the provincial government almost 75%, 74% of the total costs. That's correct. So the Whitewater region's uh, percentage of our costs, uh, percentage of the cost of the total is 26%. Uh, the federal funding is approximately 40%, and the provincial funding is 33.3%. Yeah. So really, the cost of the taxpayer, this $500,000, is essentially has bought us 30 years of service and hopefully another 30 years of service. Uh, and I think it just re-emphasizes, <laughs> after all the discussions we've had with the wastewater treatment plant here and the, and the program uh, that it was funded under, uh, this one was interesting in that the federal share was higher and that directly reduced our share down to 26%. So interesting and I'm glad that we were able to take care of this mo this this grant application, take advantage of it in order to get that extra percentages because it does make a difference when you're talking about millions of dollars. Good, Councillor Moore or Trim. 
Yes, it, it, it wasn't stated in the report, uh, but who is going to um, uh, be the contract manager for this project? Is it township staff or an engineering firm? Uh, so uh, I understand that EVB is the, the the contract manager. So that's who is helped with the uh, uh, say the design up until this point, and they are um, helping with the the tendering, uh, and then they would also monitor the the actual um, construction phase. And that's within the engineering fees of three hundred forty nine thousand. Correct. That is correct. Yeah. Good. Any other questions from members of council? Good. We'll call for a vote. All those in favor? <coughs> it's carried. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is the Westmeath Boat Launch Creek Rehabilitation Design Report Mitigation Plan. <coughs> so the recommendation is that the Council of the Township Whitewater Region receive this report regarding the Westmeath Boat Launch Creek Rehabilitation Design Report and Mitigation Plan prepared by JP2G consultants for information purposes. A mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Moore, seconded by Councillor Trim. Going over Manager Public Works. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, the township does lease uh, the, the West Meast boat launch and also the uh, Alma Poss boat launch from the Ocean and Fisheries um, at a cost of $500 per year, and the the current five-year lease uh, ends in, in September 2025. Uh, the township did retain uh, JP2G to, to complete a uh, mitigation plan for the uh, Westmeath boat launch. Um, if you recall that the issue in the past with uh, um, settlement from the, the actual creek, um, which it causes, um, causes uh, um, issues with uh, launching boat from the boat launch, um, the study did, did uh, and was uh, separated into into two phases. The first phase was was to identify the cause of, of the um, siltation, and then the second phase was how to uh, how to to, to provide uh, mitigation. Um, so, phase one, uh, JB two did include a a site investigation, water sampling. Uh, um, and a, a survey of the actual water course. Um, part of their uh, um, findings that uh, WTG provided um, were five options, um, which listed in the report. Option one was to um, dredge the report. Um, was two is actually to move the actual uh, creek into a diff different alignment. Um, option three was further to Investigate the the uh, the problem, and then option four was to uh, dredge and lower the entire ch channel, um, and then with option five, which is the staff um, was staff's um, um, idea was to uh, um, re uh, re relocate the the actual boat launch from where it is to the actual the um, um, end of the actual um, uh, peninsula. <coughs> Um, and and it's the one thing to, to note that the, the boat launch is not owned, actually owned by the by the township, but it's, it's owned by um, um, Ocean Fisheries, and and most of uh, uh, um, options would require um, DFO and um, um, sorry DFO and uh, um, a MECP and. Um, MNRF permits to, to do any work on the, on this uh, this facility. Thank you. Thank you, Lane. And I'll move to I'll go to my mover first, Councillor Moore. Any comments or questions? Actually, out of this report, I probably have more questions than I do anything. Um, I, I don't know where we'd, we would be expected to come up with, you know, possibly a million dollars or more to either move or relocate something that we don't own. So I think probably at this point, um, with further investigation, I think the option of number one of dredging would be the best to suit our township needs at this time. Um, I, I know back in the late 80s, possibly early 90s, when Reeve Gordon White was in charge, there was some dredging done at that time. 
um, and it hasn't been done since. So if it worked back then, uh, maybe that is an option for number three to investigate to find out if that is even possible at this given time. Thank you. Councillor Trim, seconder. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I can remember this uh, area being dredged twice since the early 70s and then in the 90s. And so the dredging option does uh, last for some time. And uh, it, it, as was pointed out in the report, it's a Band-Aid solution, but uh, the, basically for much of the boating season, uh, th th this um, facility uh, is, it, it can't be used. And so uh, I, I'm thinking that I know that uh, you have been working with uh, um, MPP Yakabuski's office and uh, you've asked me to join you on those meetings and uh, th there's, there may be some options uh, uh, for grants and um, I think that we should continue to actively pursue that uh, with the help of um, uh, our MPP and uh, um, uh, our mayor has included a, um, a, a local uh, member of the public who is very, very familiar with this area and who has got some, some expertise that is, uh, is willing to help. And so um, I think, I, I don't know what direction council wants or, or um, staff need, but, uh, and council would agree to, but I think we should continue to pursue the option because of um, some sort of rehabilitation and dredging even if it won't be for the very long term, it will, it will um, uh, make the facility, facility usable uh, at least for a number of years. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Trim. Uh, any other comments or questions from members of council? Okay, I'll jump in with some. Um, so the Westmeath boat launch has been a topic and I think it started last term uh, before the flood uh, when in my first experience and, and previous to that obviously by expressions of the deputy mayor, uh, deputy mayor it's an area that, that we haven't invested in in the community. Um, and it could, it has so much potential I mean, it's a beautiful spot uh, for wedding pictures, but there's there's nothing there. And when you go there, the picture that you saw on your screens earlier, if you go there in the month of August, you're lucky if you can get a kayak out. Um, now, this uh, last term, um, we did have a Westmeath Recreation Task Force that looked at this and explored some of the options and, and gathered some input from the community as to, is there another location that we could move this to if if uh, dredging it wasn't an option and uh, that approved very difficult and I'm not surprised even just relocating it is a million dollars uh, picking a whole new location would be just as expensive if not near impossible after you try to purchase property on on, on the river so, as Councillor Trim kind of indicated, in the background, knowing that this study was ongoing, uh, community members had, had um, indicated some interest of just trying to see if they could help solve the problem with some uh, further discussions. So, uh, a company uh, rep who just happened to actually, actually also lives in our community met with myself and a number of other people uh, members in the community on the site and gave us an example of another dredging that had occurred in another community and I can't remember the name of it Skugog Township of Skugog City of Skugog and uh, what was explained to me is that when you remove you dredge the material out of the water 
that material has to be dealt with in one of three ways. One, you can put it right back in the river, down the river. Understanding that any silt that's created in the water is what is dangerous to the aquatic life. So very rare, very difficult to just put it right back in the water. The second option is that you uh, bring it out on land, dewater it, and then depending on what it tests as having inside it, you can then have it either taken someplace to be treated as hazardous waste or put on people's, like a farmer's field or the landfill cover, whatever. The, but it would have to be dewatered first. A third option, which what is Scugog has looked at, is they, they've now created, and it's been used other places internationally, great big socks. These socks are like you'd see uh, farmers might wrap their round bales in. That's what it might look like in the end. Great big sock that you put the soil, the silt back in. They put these socks back in the water and they actually create another peninsula, like basically a foundation by which to do something on. So what Skugog is doing is to avoid trying to transport the silt or put the silt back in the water, they're putting the silt in these socks and using the socks to rebuild the area around their boat launch and waterfront. So the, uh, the number figure, and I know in the presentation here, dredging option four, which is dredging the, the entire channel, has been <coughs> indicated to be about 140,000. The number that Councillor Trim and I were given was, was about a half a million. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not cheap. And that assumes that all environmental tests are green and nothing adverse is found in the silt. Remembering that silt comes from a creek that goes through a large portion of our community. So there's some risk there. So what we're faced with is a, is a very complex situation. We have now, I think, uncovered a huge amount of information about it. At least with that information, we can make decisions to go forward. Um, we can't go forward without involving MNRF and MECP and DFO because the concrete pad portion down to where it ends is DFO, Department of Fisheries and Oceans. So you have these three departments that we have to involve. The funding for this, I don't think we can source internally. That's my opinion only. And I'm not asking for a, a consensus or a vote, but I don't think we can look at it without exploring a grant. You can't explore a grant unless you essentially have a shovel-ready project, which means we will have to invest in this to get it to a point that it is shovel-ready. Make sense so far? Good. If we're going to put this much money into this boat launch, there are other things that we should incorporate as part of that project the beautification, like a picnic area, a sitting area, you know, a, a nice viewing area, whatever the perspective is, if you're going to put this much in money into it, you're going to have to look at it more holistically. So I'm putting this all out to say this is a very complex issue that I don't expect we are prepared to make a decision today. The motion on the table is to receive the report only. What I'd like to suggest to Council is, is that we ask that this report and the recommendations be pushed onto our Community Services uh, Committee, which comprises of our number of rec organizations within the community. We ask them to take a look at this and provide their input into this to, before it comes back to us to make a decision on how we might want to proceed. Now, Clerk, I don't, do I need to amend the motion? Or we can still receive it and direct it down to a committee. I think there is a... So, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I feel that you can, I don't know if it, it's table. There's something because you don't have enough information so you can take it back to committee, at to committee level. Yeah, I mean, I would just re receive, move the motion, pass the motion as is, and just direct staff to uh, provide the information to committee for their consideration 
And what we would do as staff is I've noted as a budget idea for 2025 that we would come back with a summary of what the committee has said and maybe propose uh, maybe a monetary amount into reserves, maybe it be a full project for next year or, or something of the like, uh, whether it's uh, a contribution to some beautification in the, in the interim until we could, we could secure some funding. So uh, move the motion as is and just generally just direct uh, through myself that the report be distributed to the committee members for their consideration and input and then we'll come back to council as part of the 2025 budget in August, September, October with some type of project around the boat launch. Does that work? I think I understand that. Uh, I'm going to just, uh, sorry, and I, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm looking at council. There's no questions with respect to the CAO. Yeah, Councillor Moore. Once we get beyond that and it goes to committee, would that be a proper place for a task force? Just a question, just throwing that out there. Like a task force to look at it in more detail, specifically? Yes. Yeah. I think we can, we can explore that. I, I'm just interested in getting the com committee's input in the meantime. Um, but yeah, I don't think all options would be on the table. Any other questions with respect to what the CAO said? Good. If those people that are viewing are wondering why is this boat launch such an important part, not just from a wet meat perspective, but it is the only public access to this portion of the river that has rapids at the Quebec Bridge and then rapids further down about Bromley Line. So publicly, it's the only way for the public to access this water, OPP to access the water, MNRF to access the water, or MECP to access the water. So it is, it has strategic interests, not just for us in our community of Westmeath and, and our residents. Good, Councillor Tower. With you having said that, your mayor, where are they launching from when they can't launch in our, in our area? So Councillor Trim, do you want to try that? Uh, people are using uh, private property. Uh, and uh, just to expand upon what the mayor has correctly said, uh, this also includes Quebec. There's no public access to this body of water, which is a widening or a lake effect of the Ottawa River, and it's called the Lower Allumet Lake. And uh, it, it's, it's beautiful, and it's uh, a, a it's wonderful place for fishing, particularly. And um, uh, as, as has been said, the public can't access, access it uh, from public property uh, most of the summertime. And, uh, and so, again, just to further a little bit what the mayor said previously, these, um, um, uh, these geotubes, which are big socks, kill two birds with one stone. Because when you look through the options, uh, one option was to just dredge. And the other, and get rid of the material somehow. The other option was to create uh, a, a, another barrier to redirect the flow of the creek. Well, with these geotubes, getting rid of the material does that. You can put them in the water there, and they stay there forever. And um, vegetation can grow on them. And so it's not a, it's not an ugly thing. It's, uh, or not ugly, but uh, it's pleasant. Vegetation been growing on there, and and uh, it does it, it does seem to give a solution to two of our problems if we go that way. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good. Okay. So if uh, if council is in concurrence, the recommendation stays as as um, previously moved. We're going to receive the report. The direction to staff is to take it back, ask for input from the community services committee, and include this in next year's budget, whether it's to scope out the problem to make it grant ready or another such similar recommendation. General consensus, good. Okay, so then if there is no other comments or questions, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? And it's carried. A very complex problem that has been years, like the deputy mayor said, years, uh, hopefully this is the first step 
to actually achieving what needs to be achieved there. Good, ne next item is 9.5. 9.5 is the Hilla and Sutherland Road Report that was requested at our last council meeting. The recommendation is that the council of the Township of Whitewater Region receive this report in relation to the Hilla and Southern, Sutherland Road double surface treatment to gravel projects. Mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Moore, seconded by Councillor Tabbert. Superintendent is taking taking this point, or the pump manager is? I'll do it. Yep. Superintendent Eddie. Yep. Edie, sorry. Edie, yeah. <laughs> it's not the first time that's happened. Okay, so a little background. There was a petition brought uh, to council with approximately 145 signatures enforcing turning Hyla Road to gravel was an unsuitable replacement, um, of which approximately nine or 39 signatures were from residents of the township. Uh, staff identified Zion Line as the next road rehabilitation project, but due to budget restraints, um, Hyla and Sutherland were selected. Public Works staff have been performing traffic counts to determine the annual average daily traffic counts, um, but, do, but do not have the entire road network completed yet. Um, where I lost where I was here. The, the township had traffic counts for Sutherland Road, but did not have traffic counts for Hyla Road prior to the budget process. A traffic counter was placed on Hyla Road on November 23rd, 2023, and it completed a full seven day count prior to the removal of the device. A little bit of stats for you for Hyla Road. Um, from Zion Line, the project is from Zion Line to Beechburg Road. It's approximately 2.35 kilometers long um, with a PCI index rating between 31 and 35, so very poor condition. Um, there's eight residential properties along that section of road. The average count when we took it in November was 134 vehicles. Uh, it was last constructed in 2009 with the surface, current surface is double surface treatment. Uh, Sutherland Road would, is from Highway 17 to Snake River, which is 1.35 kilometers. It, was, it got a PCI index of 42 or poor <coughs> out of 100. Uh, there's currently three residential properties along that section. The average count for it daily was 197, and that was taken April 26 to May 2nd of 2023. Um, the last construction date I have is 2005, and the current, the current road surface type is double, sur double surface treatment. Um, so staff have come up with four options for council. Um, option one being you go as budgeted, you turn the road to gravel. Option two being you apply the double surface treatment. Option three would be st it stays a status quo. And option four would be de deferred to a future budget. Um, and that's it for me with that. I'll turn it over to Manager uh, Kaliru for the financial implications. Yeah, thank you. Um, with the financial uh, um, implications, um, the uh, two reserves um, that we have for, for from the province, um, <coughs> sorry, um, is... Uh, um, about three hundred thousand um, dollars, and then an additional um, one hundred and ninety-one dollars was put in, in into reserves from the twenty twenty-four budget, um, with approximately total uh, total reserves of the OCIF and the CCBF of four hundred thousand, um, and then with the twenty twenty-five uh, CCBF contribution is two hundred thirty-six thousand, and the OCIF is. Uh, approximately seven seven hundred and forty two thousand. Thank you. Good. Thank you for that. I'll open it up to questions. Uh, my mover is Councillor Moore, so you are up first. Thank you. Um, after seeing this report and um, hearing from the residents on Hyla Road, I'd like to propose that we combine uh, number three and number four status quo and defer to a future budget. Um, certainly put that out to the floor and welcome anybody else's comment. Thank you. Good, and I'll go to my seconder, Councillor Tabert. I think because the residents want the road to remain as it is, 
I think we can do that for this year and uh, defer to a future budget to do the DST. Um, obviously, they feel very strongly. Um, so I don't think we should take it back to gravel this year if we don't have to. Good. Any other comments? Yes, Deputy Moore. Uh, thank you very much. And I would be in agreement with uh, Councillor Moore and Councillor Tabbert. Um, I would be in favor of this at this time as well. But I'm just questioning um, as far as Sutherland Road, what happens there? Do we, does it remain as is or do we proceed with Sutherland? It's because it's all part of this report. So can we leave Gila the way it is or Hila the way it is right now, but proceed with Sutherland? Has that been an option? Yeah, so the recommendation from staff, if I could. Uh, yeah, so I um, definitely can. Um, we have, we, uh, our staff have um, um, received uh, uh, communication from uh, residents on, on Sutherland, um, but, but not have spoken in public, um, unlike Hyla. CAO wants to jump in, so we'll come back. Yeah, and then only uh, out, out of uh, just kind of suggestions to the members of council, I think um, if if there is a decision, and entirely at your discretion, that we only leave HILA status quo, we could expect, uh, not, that's not 100%, that we're going to have people attend a future council meeting in a delegation Relating, relating to Sutherland Road. So uh, I think that if we're moving to status quo for Hyla, maybe that's the approach for the two roads and we re-examine uh, sort of the road work for 2025. Uh, but entirely at your discretion, you're, you're, you're able to uh, go with one versus the other. You could split them up however you, you see fit. Thanks. Good. Uh, and I'll go back, Deputy Mayor. That was your question. Yes, thank you very much. So has there been any questions, anything brought forward from residents from Sutherland, did you say, at this time? Or is it, or not, of these three residents? I, I did receive a comment form, and I spoke to the resident, and I advised them that council would be receiving today's report, mm -hmm. and that I would report back to them. Uh, they did raise concerns that... Uh, when the road was gravel in the past, there was a lot of runoff from the hill and the like. So I would expect that they would voice their objection to the change. Um, you know, recognizing similarly to the residents on Hyla Road that, um, um, you know, changing it from, from a hard surface to a gravel road is a change in the level of service. So we can expect that they're going to voice their objection to members of council in the short term future if we decide to move forward with leaving it as gravel. So we're going to reiterate what we've just done on Hyla for Sutherland if we if we move forward with that. Thanks. Good. And Councillor Tower, I'm just going to give Councillor Trim an opportunity to speak again before I come back for seconds. Yeah, Councillor Trim. Uh, yes, uh, if I may, Mr. Mayor, um, I know that at the last meeting when the delegation presented, I made this suggestion for Hyla Road uh, to maintain the status quo. And it was very well received. However, I, I'm not feeling that, that uh, uh, maybe I was under, completely understood. Uh, I know that, um, first of all, a couple of things. We as a council directed staff to come up with some kind of, with a budget uh, so that our our um, tax levy would only go up 6.2, 6.4? 5.2, sorry, sorry, getting my numbers mixed up. We, we directed staff to do that, and so when that, that delegation was behind staff, I could imagine a lot of grinding teeth from staff members because we had asked them to come up with a tax levy that would be manageable for all of our residents so that we wouldn't be adding to the, the other financial burdens that people have. They came back to us with recommendations of how that could be done. Um, and that included reducing services. I don't know if you've noticed it in your own household that the income we ha where we're getting, like for the municipality, is not enough. And um, 
uh, we're just kicking this can down the road. And, in, and for the people of Hyla, it's a bumpy road. But that's, what, that's all we're doing. And I know that the, the residents came forward with all of the reasons why it shouldn't be done. And I want to assure them that these professionals up here could have added to your list. We know all these things. It's the managing of the money so that the residents of our municipality can afford their taxes. So it, it, using uh, coal patch on surface treatment is a really inefficient way uh, to maintain a road in the first place. And we're going to do it, but I'm hoping that people who applauded last meeting understand that that's not what I was looking for. It's just a Band-Aid short-term solution to a, a problem that exists all over the province. The province of Ontario, Ontario took over the Gardiner Expressway for Toronto because they couldn't afford to fix it. We have Hyler Road. That's our Gardiner Expressway. And so uh, I, I'm hoping that I wasn't misunderstood. I want to be clear that I support staff and, um, and all of their efforts and that they are very qualified and know their job. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Councillor Trim. And back over to Councillor Tabard. Yes, yeah, so one of the concerns I had with, with changing it to gravel was when the um, daily count was taken. It was taken in November. I was informed by a couple of residents that in the spring and summer and, and fall, it's a much busier road. And if it's a much busier road, especially with gravel trucks and farm equipment, from what I've been told, we can't take it back to dirt because it'll just be washboard all the time. That was what I'm, I'm hoping for, that we will get a proper count done in a proper season to justify taking it back to gravel. Good. I'll go first to Councillor Moore and then back to the Deputy Mayor. Um, just wondering, um, member sitting at the floor here, if uh, we could proceed with some of the minor work this year, whether it be ditching and or replacement of culverts, et cetera, um, that would save us time next year if we're going to have the time available. Could we go ahead and do that this year on this budget? Hyla Road, sorry. Good. A uh, question to staff. Is that possible to do some of the other work required on that road? Okay, yeah, so yeah, we can. There's, there's some culvert replacement. Um, the only, only issue is, is, do we leave that work um, just gravel, or, or do we, or do we D, uh, DST that portion of where it's where the uh, um, road surface been affected? Good, Councillor Moore. Um, if it's going to be left on this for an unknown amount of time, then there should be either patched with coal patch or something to make it smooth and. Uh, save uh, um, manual labor by our employees, whether it be rakes, or breaks, gravel, et cetera. I think it'd be some kind of a patch on it of some sort. Good, and I noticed uh, the superintendent was also giving a thumbs up behind you. So did you have a comment, uh, Superintendent? I, I, was, I was just gonna say, yeah, the work we could still, would still be done with, with approval, obviously. We could still do the culverts and clean the ditches and. We have brushed. We have brushed it already now. Um, opened it up a little bit, cleaned it up, so there, there's still availability to do the work for sure. Good. Uh, and uh, I saw you, Councillor Trim, but Deputy Mayor is next. Uh, no, because that, I was uh, going to be asking about the culvert. Perfect. Thank you, thank Councillor Trim. Yes, thanks. Uh, to the question, I know that in the area not too far away, we're doing DST, and I'm wondering if uh, this short piece at the culver could be included if the work was done in time. And also, that right where that culvert is, there's a bit of a jog in the road. I'm wondering if that, if after a few uh, 150 years, could that be straightened when we have the road dug up? Just a thought. 
Yes, manager. Yeah, so just, to, just to be aware that um, any work done this year um, in any Band-Aid solutions, if it's DST or if it's, um, it's <coughs> again, it's putting money, at bad, like it's putting money that will have to be done in future years. Yeah. So it's putting mad, bad money at a bad project, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to pull the discussion back into the item on the agenda and trust that the staff are going to come up with an implementation plan regardless of, or in accordance with whatever we decide. Yes, Councillor Tabard, sir. So what are we gonna do with, with Sutherland? Are we leaving it uh, status quo or are we going ahead with it? I'm, uh, I haven't heard that there were any complaints about it, so I, I, why are we even discussing Sutherland? At least Hyla came here and said, we don't want it. Uh, Sutherland people have not there's only three of them. Mm -hmm. and, and is it that little circle that we're talking about? Where are we talking then? The, the major part that comes from Snake River line, is that the right road? Down to the highway, Big so hill. with the major hill. Oh. So okay. it has its own complexities. Yes, it does. We grouped it together because really one decision, that they both need to be decided together. If you were to prioritize one versus the other, uh, the traffic count and the location of the road would make Sutherland, uh, from, a, from a safety perspective, one that we would have to consider first. So we said, let's look at both of these together. That was part of the discussion at the last council meeting. Good, and just before, and I suspect, based on what, and I uh, will come back to any changing any motions on the table here in a moment, but I just wanted to make a note, and I thank staff for, for providing the stats in the report. Uh, can you just slide back up to the stats again? Yeah, that's perfect. And I know that not all this information has been available and you've been working very hard to get there. And I've seen some of the draft maps from our, our road scan that's giving us some of these numbers. So I look forward to, in this cycle, being to do a more holistic view of all of our roads. Um, and I'll share some thoughts just as an opportunity presents itself. Usually the cutoff for gravel versus DST in the textbooks that staff use is about 200 vehicles a day. So if it's got less than 200 vehicles a day, it's typically other factors have to be included. It's cheaper for it to be gravel than to be DST. You get to another number, I don't know what that number is. It's cheaper to go to asphalt over DST or triple lift versus asphalt. But those numbers guide some of our recommendations. So it's great to see those numbers there. The other thing that concerns me is I worry that there's gravel roads in the township that have traffic counts higher than the, either one of these. And there's nothing stopping those residents from coming to us and saying, if, if my gravel road has got 250 vehicles a day, why isn't it being considered for double surface treatment? For all of the same reasons, these ones are being now considered to be staying status quo. Those things are factors that have to come into that analysis that staff's making on all of our roads. The last thing that kind of scares me is when I look at these previous dates, 2005 for Sutherland, so it's lasted 19 years with a treatment or double surface treatment, which is higher than the industry average, and to still be in a poor condition at 42, whereas Hilla's is 15 years old, and it's in a very poor condition. So maybe the traffic count isn't telling us everything about that road. Maybe there are other factors in there, but this is part of that picture that has to be formed for us to make more holistic decisions. Right? And, 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 and get out of this whack-a-mole situation that we have been in the last couple of years. So I, I look forward to it. Yes, this is a little bit of a two steps forward, one step back scenario. We're still moving forward because just, just discussion is important. Uh, but anyway, I'm gonna leave it there. Those are the things that go through my head when I see these numbers. And I thank staff for doing the extra work. And of course the public for taking the time to bring it up and make sure that we hear what their concerns are. So this is important. So good, with that being said, I'm gonna go back to the mover and ask, would you like to amend the motion because the motion that's in front of us is only to receive this report. Would you like to amend that motion mover? 
i.e., you, uh, you, you, in your initial statement, was that not to receive the report, but to direct staff to maintain it at status quo and, and reapproach next year. Yeah, I would go with that. What you just said. Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to read it back just to say the council of the township of Whitewater region uh, direct staff uh, to implement the status quo option and revisit in the upcoming budget for 2025. It's good. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Do we need to add in there anything about the culvert or, or the ditching or anything that we're going to do for this this term uh, for this season? Does it need to be in there as part of it? For me, no, but I'm not okay. the mover. So. Okay. okay, I just want to be sure. Mover, do you want to amplify that? Do you want to leave it with staff to make that call? I would like to leave it with staff to make that call. Okay, good. If there's another member of council that wants to <laughs> itemize that, we can amend the motion again. But um, Councillor Moore has put a motion on the table that I just read back out. We've got it written down. Okay, and the seconder was Councillor Tabbert. Or would you like to second that amendment? No, thank you. Good, do I have a seconder for that amendment? Councillor Trim, good. Is there any discussion on this amendment? Good, good. And I'll specify, uh, yes, yeah, you know, uh, I just had to reread it in my mind. Good, uh, with that, we will, sorry, and there's no other motions, and I'm looking at Councillor Tabbert, do you have another motion to make? Okay, good. We will call for a vote. All those in favor of, sorry, just, so I, I want to make sure I do this right. Clerk, can you reread the motion just one more time, please? That the Council of Township of Whitewater Region direct staff to leave Hilla Road as status quo and defer, the, defer to the future budget regarding double surface retreating. Okay. So, sorry, that's, uh, <laughs> that's my catch. So, direct status quo and? Uh, defer to a future budget reading. Meaning. Yeah, I was keeping Hilla in Sutherland language in the bottom here and not including it up there. So it ended up including both roads. You, you want to include both roads? Yeah. Sorry. Okay, you want me to read it again? Yeah. You want both roads is what you're yeah. saying. Okay. Uh, that the Council of Township Whitewater Region uh, receive, I'm sorry, direct staff that the Township of, that the Council of Township of Whitewater Region direct staff to leave Hilla and Sutherland Road as status quo and defer to a future budget reading, meeting. In relation to the Hilla and South Road double. Okay, so one more time. Sorry, it's important. I'm so sorry. It's right in front of me, I can read it. I just can't read it, I don't know why. Okay, that council of the Township of Whitewater Region direct staff to leave Hilla and Sutherland Road as status quo and defer to a future budget re meeting regarding the double of surface treatment. Good, I'm just going to my mover. That's good. I was under the impression through the conversation that we were going to divide Hyla and Sutherland. That's right. And not include them in the, in the same. Okay, so that's not one you want to move. No, I would like to move that we discuss Hyla as status quo. And what to do with Sutherland? I'll continue as planned. Okay, good. Councillor Trim, did you still want to second that? Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, I okay. I want to go with the staff recommendation okay. that we include both. I, I'll have to come back. <laughs> I, this is why we do this. Good. Is there a seconder to Councillor Moore's motion? Okay. It is defeated. There is no seconder. <clears throat> is there another motion that would be like to be put on the table? Councillor Trim. Mr. Mayor, I would like to put on the table the motion that was read by Clerk Miller. And I'm looking for a seconder. More time. So, this motion is that the Council of Township of Whitewater Region direct staff to leave Hilla Road as status quo and defer to a future budget meeting regarding the double surface treatment. Oh, excuse me. No, no. He's, so no, he's adding Sutherland. You want to include Sutherland, I'm so sorry. <laughs> 
that the Council of Township Whitewater Region directs staff to leave Hilla Road and Sutherland Road as status quo and defer to a future budget meeting regarding the double surface treatment. So moved. Yes, so moved. And a seconder. Okay, the deputy mayor has seconded the motion. So moved by Councillor Trim, seconded by the deputy mayor. Is there any discussion on this proposal? Yes, Councillor Tavert. Um, I'm not sure if this is the right place, but I think they said that they could go ahead with the culvert and other work on Hyla Road. But I'm afraid, did you say that it would be a waste of money because if we decided to do something totally different, that we're just throwing money away. So I don't wanna see us doing something to throw money away. Um, it's either we do all the work once or we don't do it at all. I, from my point of view, but I'm going to defer to, to, to the staff, but I don't want to throw money away. Yeah. So to be clear, we're not directing them to do any extra work, but to whatever work that they plan has to be the most cost efficient possible, which would exclude wasting money just to do something. Staff, did you want to comment on that again? Yes, yeah, I was that the, 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 um, our department has a, a budget for, for culvert replacements, and if th if staff determine that the one culvert on um, Hyla or any, any culvert on, on Sutherland, for example, we would change it under that budget and not touch. It wouldn't put part of this, this capital item. But didn't wasn't it stated that it would be DST to keep it smooth or something, and then that would just be throwing money away? That's what I'm concerned about. So I'm concerned with doing the whole thing and then we have to do something else to this road next year. If, if, I, could, uh, if I could provide some clar clarification. So you're right. If we change a culvert on a road that is proposed to be status quo, traditionally, if it's DST, we would resurface it with DST. Because of the age of the current DST on that road, I would recommend... Uh, through staff and through the mayor, if it's decided that we replace a culvert, uh, if the decision is the status quo, leave it as is, don't touch it. But in an emergency, we need to change a culvert. We're going to leave it as gravel in the interim until we come back for the next year's budget and we say, are we doing this DST road? If we're not, then maybe we would apply a temporary patch over that culvert, thus not wasting taxpayers' dollars. So, um, so I think so, I, you know, from staff's point of view, I think we're prepared to status quo both projects. We will have the superintendent of public works evaluate the culverts, evaluate the ditches on both roads. If there's a need to do immediate um, maintenance work, we will do it uh, like we would anywhere else in the township. Uh, but we will reprogram some of the staff's work for this summer if that's the decision of council. Thanks. Thank you same logic gets applied to any culvert replacement based on the status of the road or what the future intention or recommendations might be to council. That way we don't hamstring them. They we continue to make the same decisions they would regardless, just taking into account what we're discussing. Good. Is there other discussion related to the motion that's on the floor? No other discussion. All right. We will call for a vote then. All those in favor of status quo for these two roads? And those against. Good. Excellent. The motion is, is, is carried. Thank you. I appreciate the exercise in Robert's rules. A little difficult, but we made it through. The lesson being is that we have to be very clear in our motions. Uh, that's my fault. But anyway. Okay. What we will do now is we are going to take a short recess of five minutes, 3.05 p.m. I'll just ask you to be seated for 3.10, please. Thank you.
And welcome back to the Township of Whitewater Region's regular council meeting for April 3rd, Wednesday, April 3rd. And we are recommencing here at 3.12 p.m. And uh, I recognize Councillor Tabard has just stepped out, but we do have quorum. She'll be back very shortly. Uh, next item on our agenda is 9. Point, oops, 9.6. Uh, the Whitewater Region Fire Department hiring and promotion policy. The recommendation before us is that the Council of the Township Whitewater Region adopt the Whitewater Region Fire Department hiring and promotion policy. A mover and a seconder, please. Moved by Councillor Tabert, seconded by Councillor Moore. And this is going to the Fire Chief. Uh, thank you. So this policy is designed to uh, clearly define how we hire and promote our members. Uh, most of this is existing practice. It's just formalizing some of the procedures and defining some of the roles and some of the definitions, uh, particularly acting uh, officers. Uh, we're just trying to push forward with a, a set policy so it's not uh, reinventing the wheel every year or two whenever we do these promotions and to really set out the parameters for uh, requirements and for the steps to go through this process. Um, given our turnover, it's fairly high in uh, the paid on-call firefighting services, us included. We also have defined uh, the hiring process and the requirements, uh, including criminal reference checks and uh, work contracts. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over for any questions. Good. Thank you, Fire Chief. And I'll go to my mover first. Councillor Tavert, any comments or questions? Uh, no, I read it over and uh, I think it's fine. Perfect. And Councillor Moore, the seconder. Uh, just a comment. Uh, nice to see this uh, policy. Um, um, all the upper tier of the management of the fire department know exactly how to proceed, and uh, and and there's no questioning as to why not to do something, um, especially with the new hires. Um, it's nice to see the references in there, which I don't think we ever had before. So it's nice to proceed uh, safely on behalf of the township. Thank you. Good. Any other comments or questions from other members of council? Good. I only had one, and it's just a, a, a <coughs> the vulnerable sector check that's required. Is that something that is out of pocket on the applicant's part, or is that something that we cover? Yeah, it is uh, on the applicants. We cover their driver's abstract. And then they do the um, the, the sector vulnerable check. Checkers. Vulnerable sector sector check. Check. Perfect. Good. And if there's no other questions, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? It's carried. Thank you, Fire Chief. Next item on the agenda is the Fire Department pay policy. The recommendation is that the Council of the Township Whitewater Region adopt the Whitewater Region Department pay policy. A mover and a seconder. Councillor Tabard and the Deputy Mayor. And back to the fire chief. Uh, thank you. So there's currently no process for our firefighters to move within the uh, pay grid. Um, we uh, we were recently, recently probably five years ago, added to the uh, the pay grid, but there's no process to move throughout it. Uh, and rather than go with an option such as years of service or hours of service, uh, we created a bit of a uh, a process where it's both years of service and required and uh, optional courses. Kind of serves two purposes. It allows progression through the pay grid. And it also checks off some of the requirements that we need within the department to function safely and, and effectively. And it rewards firefighters that are doing extra courses and, and taking these steps to, to better the department as a whole. Uh, There'll be pretty minimal uh, financial implications. There'll be some increase, but as it's uh, kind of phased in, um, hopefully in 2025 and then moving forward, uh, it won't be a major impact to the budget. Um, I think I'll turn that over for questions now. Perfect, thank you. And I'll go to the mover again, Councillor Tavert. No questions. And the seconder, Deputy Mayor. Any other questions from any other member of council? No. And I would just say congratulations on, on adding another policy to our policy handbook here. It's important to see the progress and to recognize the qualifications. So uh, 
I guess that would lead to a question. Is this something that is implemented in other townships within the county? It's really difficult to answer that. There's so many different processes for payment within uh, fire departments. Some are on a point system where they have an allotted salary per year and it's divvied up in points depending on how many responses you went to. Um, I would say this is probably a lot more structured than most existing processes. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. No other questions? We'll call for a vote. All those in favor? And it's carried. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is notices of motion. Is there any notices of motion from members of council today? That's good. I see none. Next is correspondence. Uh, there are no items that are requiring direction tonight, uh, but we have a number of informational items. And I'll just highlight if there is uh, a member of council who would like to, to, to bring something out. We'll just go through them sequentially. The first one is a runway report from the Pembroke Area Airport, their 2023 annual review newsletter. The second item, a voluntary merger the Renfrew County and District Health Unit. It's their media release. I spoke to it in my mayor's address uh, over the past two council meetings. Uh, item C, which is the National Public Safety Telecommunications Week 2024 and the National Public Safety Telecommunications Week. Uh, it's a proposed proclamation. Now maybe I will ask the CAO if he could speak to this one uh, for council. Don't have any much more details than what is provided in the in the letter. I think that um, uh, the gentleman um, from OPS EU, so the Ontario Public Service Employees Union, has communicated directly with me uh, to get this to council for their consideration. Um, and per our discussion earlier this week, it appears as though we have proclaimed the township that is uh, proclaimed. Um, the National Public Safety Telecommunication Week in the past. So, um, you know, entirely at the discretion of council, if, uh, if a member of council moves the motion to proclaim, uh, certainly we will communicate that back to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, the, the gentleman who submitted the, uh, the letter. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks, CEO. Is there any member of council that would wish to move the, the recommended proclamation that was included in that package? C. Councillor Moore, is there a seconder? Councillor Trim. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Moore and Councillor Trim. And just for the purpose of the public, who is probably not accessing their agenda package as we speak, maybe Clerk, could you um, provide uh, the motion yes. as, that's included in the proclamation or the CAO? Yeah, if you want, so that let's. I'll read it out. To, is that that's what you're looking for, yes, uh, Mayor Nicholson? Yeah. So yeah, so that the that the council of the township of Whitewater Region proclaim the week of April 14th to the 20th, 2024, as the National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week. Period. Moved by Councillor Moore, seconded by Councillor Trim. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? And we are proclaiming April 14th, April 20th, National Public Safety Telecommunications Week. So what we'll do is through our communications lead staff, we're going to prepare a poster and post it on social media, uh, and it'll be re recorded in our minutes as well. So a quick poster highlighting the dedication of these professionals, and it'll be, it'll be advertised through our social media feeds. Thanks. Thank you, CAO. Next item is the gas tax program, the 2023-2024 eligibility town of Renfrew, Ministry of Trans Transportation Transit Dis Division, the gas tax program funding town of Renfrew. Uh, I'm gonna, I don't know if it's the treasurer or the CAO, but could one speak to that so that that is common language for the members of the public? Sure, I can. So. What happens is there's a transportation system that receives gas tax funding, which comes from the federal government. Uh, we receive gas tax funding every year, and we allocate $600 uh, towards this project uh, for the uh, uh, Sunshine Coach. 
and that's what where we uh, con that's our contribution to that to that purpose. Thank you. Six hundred dollars a year from our gas tax. That's correct. And this recognizes that formally. Exactly. Excellent. Uh, one request is that if from the Sunshine Coach perspective, would it be possible to have them do a presentation to council? Uh, just to articulate the services that they provide to our residents so we can be better appraised to what that $600 is, is providing? Yeah, so noted uh, with, with the clerk so that we could get them on a future agenda. Thanks. Excellent, thank you. The last item is the medical officer's report um, for Renfrew County District Health Unit. Um, it's provided in there for your information. That is from uh, Dr. Morgenstern, our uh, medical officer health for the health unit. Uh, and just for your information, I think April 17th, we have asked Dr. Morgenstern to come and present to council. So today we received a presentation from their lead on emergency management, uh, but the actual medical officer health will come on April 17th to help outline some of the things he's working on, including that opioid drug strategy. Good, that's it for correspondence. The next item is announcements and I'll start with the Deputy Mayor. I have nothing at this time, thank you, Mayor. Councillor Tabbert. Just a reminder that the uh, Cobden Community Players performance is this Friday, Saturday and Sunday at the Cobden Ag Hall. Awesome, and Councillor Moore. Yeah, I just won the Water Task Force meets tomorrow at 1 o'clock for tours. Thank you. Excellent. And Councillor Trim. Uh, yes, a couple. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, the um, Pancake Breakfast uh, Lions Club, uh, 13th, uh, and it would be on our calendar. And I guess maybe I don't need to repeat that, but it's just I'd like to remind people of the good work that the Lions Club is doing. Uh, anyway, that's, uh, th that's coming up on the 13th, uh, pancake breakfast. Uh, also, yesterday we had our monthly seniors, Whitewater Seniors meeting, and one of our partners joined us, um, um, the, uh, the manager of the Eganville and District Seniors uh, group, uh, uh, Kayla Marquist. And uh, I just want to uh, report to council what she said about our staff. Uh, as, you, as you know, the, the, the Whitewater Seniors has taken over the Meals on Wheels program and also the curbside um, dinner registration part of the program. And uh, uh, Julie and um, uh, Stephanie and Joyce uh, have uh, apparently done a, a superlative job in that in trans transition. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, uh, the CAO would pass on uh, those remarks to staff, please, uh, because uh, it, it, it really, uh, she really made the point that the, they were doing such a good job. Uh, got another announcement here also. Um, Tuesday, April 23rd, uh, here in the basement between 6 p.m. and 8.30 p.m. in the e evening. Um, it, it, there's going to be a, uh, an open house workshop about um, a building. So this is the announcement that was prepared for me to read. Uh, starting a building or development project? Have questions about your project or the application process? The township's community developed Development Department is hosting an evening open house for residents. Staff will be on hand to answer your questions and provide information on building permits and planning processes. Be sure to bring any plans or drawings you have. So the building, CBO, Chief Building Official, Building Inspector, and um, Planner all will be there to help people who are are, are, are planning uh, new construction. Now there's a second part to this, uh, this uh, announcement, which I almost hesitate to read in case it discourage people, discourages people from coming. We're also featuring a special guest in honor of Earth Day, which is that day. 
To kick the evening off, Councillor Joey Trim will give a talk on his experience improving the energy efficiency of his home and installing an air source heat pump. Come and hear about his lessons learned and find out how you can save energy in your home. Money is what you save. And that's what I'll be talking about. Thank you. What time is it? 6 to 8.30 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Trim. I, I'm wondering, staff, from, can we include that in the community calendar? Is that possible to? Yeah, we'll we'll add that in the community calendar. In fact, I I have the I had the current open in front of me, the the final draft, which will be sent in the next week, and it is also provided in there, which will be provided to all the residents of our community. So, uh, so that the the next version of the current will be issued uh, likely next week or the following week. So, excellent. Thank Thanks. you. And uh, I note that the Lions Clubs pancake breakfast, which I had not noted, isn't on there. If anybody's in contact with a member of the Lions Club, could encourage them to add the information to the calendar. Um, maybe it'll encourage other people that might be interested in attending. Excellent. Oh, do you see a... Oh, you see another. Sorry. Another item? There's a trivia night at the... Uh Cobden Legion, hosted by the, uh, B, the library, Whitewater Library. Uh, I'll have to get that onto the calendar as well. They're on the 19th. 26th. That's St. Andrews on the 19th. So lots of trivia nights. Excellent. It's good. Okay. Anyway, encourage the use of the calendar. Uh, the members of the community that aren't on social media really appreciate that this is populated with some of the options in our community. I have no additional announcements. Thank you, clerk. <laughs> bylaws. Uh, next item on the agenda. We have uh, two bylaws in our confirmatory bylaw. The recommendation is that be it, be it resolved that the bylaws listed on the April 3rd, 2024 agenda be taken as read and passed. A mover and a seconder, please. Moved by the deputy mayor, seconded by Councillor Trim. Is there any final comments, questions, or concerns with respect to those items? listed on the agenda. Seeing none, we'll call for a vote. All those in favor? It's carried. Uh, item number 14 was our closed session, which was dealt with at 11 o'clock this morning. And therefore, we move on to the adjournment. And we are adjourned at 3.30 p.m. Thank you. <laughs>